Welcome to Short Term Rental Riches, quick actionable ideas to help you along your real estate investment journey, but with a specific focus on short term rentals. Welcome back to the Short Term Rental Riches podcast. Happy you're here again, as always, and I'm happy to have Amanda Hahn back with me again for the second part of this two part series. She's with Keystone CPA, she's my tax advisor and my accountant, and we covered some really good topics last week. So if you missed it, Make sure you catch it because it will be relevant to you if you're a short-term rental investor or you're a real estate investor in general. So I'm excited to be back for the second part covering, again, some really, really important topics. Without further ado, let's jump back in. I talk about leverage all the time on on the podcast. I'm, you know, especially with interest rates now, they're just unbelievable, Um, you know, and if we can lock them in for 30 years so. That is, that is a great point. Now, we do have some things to consider when we're depreciating the real estate, though, and that's when we want to turn around and maybe sell the property later on. Do you want to explain how that works? We have to add it back in? Yeah. So the way it works is when you take depreciation, you, you are basically uh, reducing your cost basis in the property. Right. So let's say I bought the property for 100,000. I took 20,000 depreciation. Now my remaining basis is 80,000. Right. That's what I paid for that I I haven't depreciated Mm -hmm. yet. So later on, when I sell that property, let's say I sell it for $100,000. Right. Now uh, I have a tax gain of 20,000 because I already wrote off that first 20. So later on, when I sell it, part of that becomes taxable income. Even given that though, it is still beneficial to take depreciation because you are still delaying the taxes into a future year when you actually mm-hmm. sell the property. Whereas you know today we're getting a tax saving, which is more money for me to reinvest in the interim. Um, but of also you know, with respect to real estate, at least currently, we still have the ability to do a 1031 exchange um, which right. just means that let's say I do want to sell this short-term rental in a couple of years, then later on, if I replace it with other rental properties, I should be able to defer the taxes on the gains as well as the depreciation that I took already. So, yeah. um, you know, that's a huge benefit for real estate investors that, uh, you know, something that there's been talks that might go away and uh, we're hoping that that will stay around for a long time. Fingers crossed. Um because that is a big one. That is a big one. And we've talked about 1031 exchanges before. Another way you might be able to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you might be able to defer it is if you invest in an opportunity zone. Is yes. that yeah. another potential option? Yeah. So currently, um, you know, to the extent you sell property and you have capital gains, you can uh, delay the taxes if you reinvest that into an opportunity zone. Um, it could be an opportunity zone real estate, could opportunity could be a business located in the opportunity zone. Um, so, so, but for the most part, when we have clients that are reinvesting in the O zone, it is as a passive investor in other people's deals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I only have one client who's kind of actively doing their op- own opportunity zone just because there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, it's more than just buying a property that's located in the zone. You have to actually do significant improvements to the property. Um, in order to get the tax benefit, but yeah, that's a, you know that's so that's mm-hmm. a great point. You know, you can, in terms of tax deferral, you're looking at 1031 exchange opportunity zone. There's also offset strategies, right? Let's say that I'm selling this um, this rental property and uh, I'm not ready to buy yet. I'm not ready to buy another uh, property within the next six months. Well, if before the end of the year, I do end up buying more real estate, even though it's outside of the 1031 exchange period, as long as it happens within the same year, I can still use depreciation, cost segregation, write-offs from that new rental to reduce the taxes on the rental that I sold too, right? So Mm. you can offset it outside of a 1031 exchange as well. You know that the tax world is always changing right and it's so it can be really complicated i know a lot of times i get confused and um that's why it's just so important it's something that i think a lot of people leave till the end of the year right and they're like oh how can i figure this out but but really it's something that we need to be thinking about all the time especially if we're getting into big investments or planning on selling or or buying or whatever we're doing it's really something that we need to consider the whole way through and one of the things that you 
taught me early on was just doing uh, an ex filing an extension. I used to never do that. Um, can you explain that real quick? Just, you know, filing an extension? Yeah, yeah. I know. So I think some people are just kind of afraid of the concept of extension, but it's actually something, you know, obviously the IRS allows you to do. So, um, you know, the benefit of having an extension, I mean, one for if anyone who's not organized yet, and, you know, as you, you get into more and more real estate, there's a lot more things to account for. And so it takes longer, right? right? You can't really just close your books a month after right. your rent. It just takes longer to get everything in and make sure you're capturing your expenses. So the benefit of extension is that it gives you more time to analyze all the numbers and get everything right, rather than pushing it through the April deadline. Um, the other benefit that we really like about uh, extensions is it gives you insight into that following year. You know, so right now we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out, okay, if we already, you know, if I haven't filed last year's returns yet, um, if I know, okay, later up, you know, eight and six months later, I know, oh, well, I was going to do a, a cost segregation, but I, I might sell this property after all. You know, I might not do a 1031 exchange. So now we have that hindsight and we say, okay, knowing what I know today, do how do I want to file last year's return? And those are things that sometimes it's impossible to answer, right? You don't even know the answers mm -hmm. to that um, by February or March or April, because some of those those transactions come to your head or become available to you later on in the year. And, mm -hmm. and the transactions in that year, you know, might impact how you would want to file the previous year's tax return. So that's another uh, benefit of doing extensions. Uh, I will say though, you know, there are some uh, things that, that come with extensions and that the IRS allows you more time to file your return, but you don't get additional time to pay the taxes, which means mm, if you point. think you're gonna owe taxes, you do wanna pay them before April 15th to try to avoid or minimize any potential penalty. All right, which would just be uh, uh, an interest charge on the amount that you potentially owe. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be something like that. Penalties. Right. So if you owe something by April but you don't pay until um, June, then there's two months worth of interest and penalty. Then yeah, I know some investors do weigh the cost of that against you know the cost of them to borrow money, right? <laughs> like with mm -hmm. money loans and things like that. So yeah. That certainly is a consideration as well. Yeah, I remember I used to just, you know, try to cram everything in before that deadline. And then it's like, you know, you file your taxes and two weeks later, you discover something else that you could have potentially right. written off, you know, maybe some plumbing renovation for a thousand bucks. Well, now to go back and amend it, one that it's just a pain in the butt, right? I mean, right. Yeah. and yeah. can be costly. Yeah, so it costs you money to maybe amend it, uh, you know, paying to do redo the work. Uh, and also, more importantly, the increase in audit risk, right? Whenever mm. you have to do an amended return, you need to tell the IRS what changed and, you know, why did these change? And so it's come, you know, it's just kind of the, the, the process of explaining, oh, okay, I forgot a plumbing receipt and all that. Uh, just raises an eyebrow that you otherwise maybe didn't need to. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly something to, you know, take into consideration too. A lot of uh, people when they're starting out with short-term rentals mm -hmm. or investing in general, they, and this is what I did, uh, is I bought a fourplex, right? Mm -hmm. So I lived in one unit, renovated the other ones, rented them out, which is both your primary residence, but also an investment property. But because it's an investment property, you get to write off the percentage of the investment, right? Now, you also have some benefits with it being your primary residence where you get your personal tax exclusion. I don't know what they call it, but 250000 if you on Correct. capital gains. Yes. Do you want to just explain kind of how that might work if someone out there has a smaller uh, multifamily property up to a fourplex and they're either renting it with short-term rentals, but it's also primary residence, kind yeah, of some yeah. things that- We consider. do see that a lot as well, like you said, especially people starting up or people who are you know, single that are able to kind of move around quickly. Um, so yeah, the way it works, I mean, in a simplistic example, right? That you know, if it's a, um, let's say it's a, a duplex, one unit is a rental, one unit is a primary home. So on the unit that is a rental property, mm -hmm. You know, it's treated like any other rental, short-term rental, where you're taking uh, you're taking depreciation on the property, you're writing off, you know, all the costs associated with that property, including rehab, furnishing, and all that. Now, the other side, that other part of the duplex, which is your primary home, 
you're still writing up the mortgage interest and property taxes as your home. Um, <clears throat> and if you have a home office in there, right, let's say one of the rooms right. in the office, you're writing up a home office like normal. Uh, and then the benefit is eventually if you were to sell the property, you know, part of that gain would be tax free, assuming that you lived in that unit as your primary home for at least two years um, mm -hmm. and three years within the date of sale. So, so you, you know, as a single person, you exclude up to 250,000. If you're married up to 500,000. And then mm -hmm. the other part, that's the rental portion. You know, if you sell it for a gain, you could potentially do a 1031 exchange. So that's super right. powerful where some tax free, some tax deferral, and then writing off on both parts of that duplex. You know, even if it wasn't a duplex or a fourplex, but maybe they had a guest house mm -hmm. and they were renting the guest house, that's still going to sort of function the same way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's a similar in terms of, you know, eventually when you sell, um, the key is, you know, for that to be primary home for at least a minimum of two years in order to right. get primary home gain exclusion. Mark your calendars, everyone. That's an important day. <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh, you know, I, I've done that before and I, I mean, it's amazing if, and especially all the money that we've been printing and inflation and asset prices are going really high. So a lot of people have a lot of equity in their homes right now. Yeah. Um, and to be able to take that tax free, man, that's just a, that's a really powerful one for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you can use that. It's not a one-time deal, right? So, um, so you right. can use that strategy over and over again, right? Live here, you know, for two years and sell it, move into another place, live there for a couple of years and sell it. Mm -hmm. So we do have clients who kind of use that as a strategy in going forward as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, I mean, you're exactly right in that, you know, it's, I mean, it's no secret the government has been printing money and, you know, at some point yeah. we're going to have to pay. We have to pay, right? So I, I know it's crazy. Um, so it is really, really important to, to spend the time to think about, I know people don't like to talk about taxes uh, because it's, you know, could be very scary and unpleasant, but um, I think, you know, you've seen like, in like, you know, from your own experience, how tax savings could be uh, so impactful, right? When you, when it's mm -hmm. done correctly, it can be so impactful, um, doesn't have to be the super scary thing. And, you know, um, and going back to what you're saying about leverage, you know, if you can save, um, $10,000 in taxes, that could be $50,000 more of real estate, right? If you're using yeah. the right, right. If it's 20% down. Yeah. yeah. Taxes, super, super important. I highly encourage anyone out there just spend more time on your taxes. You should be tax planning, right? And I think people are often scared to just tax planning itself sounds really scary, but um, you know, I think, you know, from working together, it's really the, I mean, our goal is not for you or any investor to become a CPA and understand everything there is to know. Um, I think even mm -hmm. today, some of the things we talked about, you were like, wait, I didn't know. <laughs> um, yeah, this is true. This is very true. <laughs> but, but really the, the, the job of an investor is to just have the basic knowledge, but but really the, the key action item is just to make sure that you are updating your CPA and your tax advisor as trans before transactions occur. You know, here's what I'm mm -hmm. thinking. What are my options? What's the tax? Just so you don't get a surprise, you know, tax bill at the end. Right. And that, that's yeah. really all you need to do. <laughs> so a quick example, real life example of this right now, I'm selling some condos. Uh, and before we decided to sell them, I emailed you and said, Hey, Amanda, I'm looking at selling these properties. I think this is what they can go for. This is what I owe, you know, and then we were able to get a rough estimate of what my tax burden would be either in the current year or potentially in the future year. So this right. particular property, we decided to sell next year. So it's supposed to close. No, we're in next year already. Yeah, we already it's 2021. Like <laughs> so uh, it's supposed to close in one week. So right after the new year turned, but that basically gives us a whole year to do some more planning. We have a limited time if we're going to do a 1031 exchange, but, but right. we have other ways to expense maybe some of the income, the capital gains from a, from a different spot. Exactly. So that's exactly what we're talking before about, uh, you know, if, you know, so, so first step is, okay, what is the potential taxes? And then you as an investor make the decision. Do I want to do a 1031 exchange? Do I want to go into a different business venture? And if so, then are there offset strategies from my new business, right? If it's a laundromat, right. if it's a, a startup business, are there offset strategies where I can use this to offset the real estate gain? Um, so yeah, that's, you know, timing is key too, right? Like if you're selling at the beginning yeah. of the year, you have all year. 
And if at the end of the, you know, before the end of the year, you say, hey, I do want to do more real estate, then great, you buy more rental properties, and then that can be used to offset the gains on the properties you're selling in January. Let's see, let's just talk about some of the basic expenses. Someone, someone's investing in real estate or investing in, you know, real estate to turn into a short term rental we get to, we have a lot of expenses or a lot of different things we can write off. And so for the short-term rental, that can be the furniture, of course. Yeah. I'm for, furniture. So, um, for furniture, you generally don't need a cost segregation because it's something that you are buying yourself, right? You're going. Oh, right, right. Furniture. Okay. Yeah. Cost segregation is usually for the, the kind of the internal components of a building, things that you and I don't you know, we can't break out maybe visually or, you know, so that's what that would be like cabinets, like built in cabinets and stuff like that. Flooring. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, furniture is, uh, you know, furniture fixtures, appliance is a huge one, uh, especially for short term, (laughs) for short term. Right. And now there, there's a, there's a point there where you can either write off all of that expense in the first year, or you have to depreciate. I think it's 2000 something, or what is that? Um, so yeah, that's a good question. So the, the 2,500 is the de minimis rule, which says, okay, if you have an improvement that you're making to the real estate, um, but if it's under $2,500, you can write those off immediately. Um, the full now, expense. Yeah. As an expense. Now for furniture, fixture, appliance, things like that, uh, currently at least those are um, considered, usually considered five to seven year property. So even if it's over that dollar amount, we can take what's called bonus depreciation, which essentially results in the same uh, answer of immediately writing off all mm-hmm. of it in the first year you place it into service. So, um, so yeah, two different terms used a little bit differently, but the result is the same. Okay, so we've got all of our furniture, any improvements, uh, but we also have a lot of smaller type expenses like consumables and, you know, toilet paper and uh, cleaning products and things like that, that we're going to be able to expense. Yeah, right. With every rental too. Those usually are just considered supplies, you know, operational supplies, supplies. write those off. Um, The only things that we, you know, we talk about depreciation, those are things that have a, a useful life of longer than a year. Um, mm-hmm. I know people are hoarding, you know, toilet paper and stuff, but <laughs> the useful life is yeah. prob- probably you're going to use all that up in the year. <laughs> right, right. Do you have a short-term Airbnb guest like hoarding your toilet paper stash? <laughs> I'm sure that we had more toilet paper disappear than we normally would. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't monitor- monitoring it roll per roll, but, um, you know, we recently went to a hotel supplier and purchased like just I don't know like thousand or something rolls at a time so So you are the hoarder then (laughs) (laughs) I am the hoarder now yeah (laughs) that's right um but wow yeah toilet paper got really expensive there for a moment especially if you're ordering on Amazon which is what we had historically done I mean yeah it it went through the roof and you can't rent a rental with no toilet paper so uh (laughs) Okay, so we've got our supplies, we've got our, we've got our furniture costs, any renovation costs. Now on the, the loan side, we get to write off any origination fees or an appraisal uh, yeah. and also interest, right? Yeah, so the interest you write off immediately, the loan costs, you know, all the loan costs that are associated, you know, appraisals, origination fees, closing costs, uh, those are generally amortized. So loan fees are generally amortized over the life of the loan. So you have a 15 year oh, loan, right. you write off over 15 years. If you have a 30 year loan, it goes off over 30 years. But yeah, I think, you know, it's just in comparing short term versus long term rentals, you know, the first year startup cost is, is obviously, you know, higher, usually speaking mm-hmm. for short term versus long term, just because of the furnishing and supplies and all that you have to stock. But really, you know, uh, from a cash flow perspective, we see much better performance in short-term rentals. And also from a tax perspective too, like, you know, long-term rentals, um, you know, I mean, if you make under 150,000, it's fine. We don't really care about real estate professional or any of that. But if you make over 150,000, you're really, you know, the goal would be to try and qualify as real estate professional status uh, versus for Mm -hmm. short-term rentals. You know, again, the, you know, you don't have to worry about real estate professional. You just need to want to meet the material participation. Which is 500 hours. Yeah, there's actually seven tests. Um, I won't go over you know, all, all of them just because a lot of them is, are very difficult to qualify. But the two most common one, one is the 500 we talked about. Uh, the other one is actually um, somewhat easy still. So 
The other one is if you can't spend 500, then you would, you have to spend at least a hundred hours in the short-term rentals and you have mm -hmm. to spend more time than anyone else in the short-term rental property. If you have a cleaning crew, for example, that goes in, mm -hmm. uh, that's, you have to compare that. How much time is Tim spending versus how much time is the cleaning crew spending, right? If you got gardeners, you got repair people, property management company, that's what you're up against your time versus their time. So that's a second tier. We have some clients that try to go under that, but you know, I think the strongest one is to try to go for the 500 hour. And I mean, this is all sort of new or relatively new, I guess I should say. And, and so actually determining that, like if, if you had, you know, a housekeeper's hours versus like a receptionist hours, for example, someone an answering calls and answering mm -hmm. messages. I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to, to really prove maybe that one's spending more time than the other. I, I don't know. It, yeah, you know, if, right. And that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, the short-term rental space is so new, right, in, in general. And so the tax side of it, the auditing um, of it is, is also new as well. So, yeah, that's one of the hurdles that I see in court cases where you say, okay, well, uh, how do we prove how much time the cleaning crew was there? Or how, how do we prove how much time the property management company was there versus Tim's time, right? It's a difficult question to answer. But I think, you know, the downside of it is when it comes to taxes, uh, what I always say is the taxpayer is guilty until proven innocent, right? Mm. So it's always upon us to prove our case. If you can't get the hours records from your cleaning crew, for example, then the next best thing to do is to, to be able to get a reasonable amount of hours. So we say, okay, well, reasonably speaking, right? If you talk to different people from Molly made as an example, how many hours does it take to clean a three bedroom, two bath, 1200 square foot, right? And then yeah. you go from there, you can say, okay, you build a case to say, okay, this is how much time on average it takes. I didn't track how much time Cindy spent, but here's on average. Yeah. And this is yeah. how much time spent. But yeah, I mean, the tried and true is still, you know, to have people track hours. And unfortunately, a lot of the new changes in the tax world in the last couple of years have been hours driven, have this recurring question, like, how am I going to get the hours from my management company or from my cleaning crew? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. You know what else might be kind of tricky too? And I guess I haven't asked you about this yet because I'm not personally doing, but there's this model of lease arbitrage, which those are still short-term rentals but someone's actually leasing an apartment or a house or whatever it is and subleasing it. Now I would assume they still get these same write-offs in terms of furniture and consumables and all that. But if they're not buying the property, then they don't have the depreciation expense, right? Exactly. Uh, on the building at, on the anyways. Building. Exactly. On the building. But is there anything else they might want to, you know, for those, uh, the listeners that are doing the lease arbitrage model that they might want to consider with, um, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, we do have clients who are doing the arbitrage and doing very well in that space. Mm -hmm. So, um, certainly, you know, something to look into if it's, you know, you don't have enough capital, right. To go and buy a bunch of real estate, or maybe you just don't want to. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, the main benefit, or I guess the, 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 I mean, you get the same benefits, the material participation, the ability to use those losses to offset other income is the same as a, a regular short-term rental that you own. Um, but the big difference is like you mentioned, um, no depreciation on the building because we don't own the building, right? Mm -hmm. But in lieu of that, we get to write off the rent that we're paying to the actual property owner. So it's still some benefit. Yeah. Um, it just comes in a different form. It, we, we call it rent expense rather than depreciation expense. Well, um, what else do you think we should know about? <laughs> is there anything that... <laughs> <laughs> that, we, that we've missed. I know that the topic of taxes is so big and there's so many different ways you can go with it, but is there anything that you've seen maybe that we haven't talked about? Um, well, I think I just want to say, I know, um, you know, like we were talking earlier, short-term rental is still fairly, a fairly new space, right? I know not for you, mm -hmm. <laughs> not for you and I, but it's fairly new to a lot of people, to, you know, just yeah. real estate industry as a whole. And I think we'll continue to see changes, um, in both, you know, practically speaking in terms of how they operate and also from tax treatment, um, as more of these get audited, they might define more of some of the questions we talked about. How do we prove the time of the workers that we hire and things like that? So it's really mm -hmm. important to just make sure you 
uh, are staying up to date with you know your tax advisor and getting kind of the latest and in, in the various tax treatments and things like that. But I think, you know, for investors, I know, you know, like you, taxes, there's so much to talk about. But the yeah. key thing to remember is that um, you don't have to become a CPA. You don't have to memorize any of the rules or you don't even have to understand 50 percent of what we talked about today. But, you know, just kind of know enough to have a good conversation with your own tax advisor. Um, but I think most importantly is to keep that line of communication open with, you know, what your transactions are talking to advisors about that before you do it um, and being proactive throughout the year. You know, what are some things I need to do? Mm -hmm. We talked about, you know, real estate, like some of the benefits, like, okay, we need to track our expenses. We need to know what the appliances are. So make sure you have a system to track those, right? Just because you now know it's deductible doesn't mean automatically your CPA will deduct it. You need to track those things or have a system mm -hmm. bookkeeping bookkeepers to track it. Um, we talked about material participation, the hours you need, whether 500 or 100 hours, you need to know what to track and how to track it and have those systems in place. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's the main action item from an investor's perspective to be doing during the year. And I think a good thing that can help out with that is using QuickBooks online, because if it's linked with your bank accounts, if it's linked with your credit cards, and let's say you buy a new appliance, well, then that's going to show up in your QuickBooks and there's going to be a transaction there that, that you're going to need to label one way or another, right? Um, exactly. And that's why I mean, I love, you know, as a, I think for me as an investor and a business owner, I love the concept of um, systems, right? S systemizing. Mm -hmm. Uh, automating. So yeah, what you described with QuickBooks is a really great example. Um, not to say that everybody needs to go out and use QuickBooks. You know, I think for right. someone like you got lots of properties, you know, partners, all kinds of stuff, then yes, QuickBooks makes your life so much easier. But, mm -hmm. you know, for a smaller investor, um, if you're not into, um, you know, the, you know, those kind of software, even if you're using Excel, right? It's better than nothing right. at all. When you spend money, put it into Excel, download your statements into Excel format, kind of accomplish similar things. Yeah, it just depends how much uh, time you want to put in or how much you like. But I don't like the bookkeeping side. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, I love numbers and investments and like looking at projections and things like that. But the tedious, like everyday transactions and with short-term rentals there's tons and thousands you know you get yeah. rents coming in every day and so it's a lot to organize but if you're diligent with it yeah i agree you can use excel you can use whatever works best for you as long as you're tracking it is the most yeah. important thing well thank you so much amanda it was really great having you on as the first interview guest first interviewees so uh, i'm sure people <laughs> Uh, appreciated getting a break from my voice. It's been over a, a year now. So nice to have you on. And, and for anyone that wants to get more information about you or find out about Keystone CPA, what's the best way for them to uh, get in touch with you? Uh, our website is the best way. Uh, we have uh, tons of great uh, information uh, and tax updates and things like that. So www.keystonecpa.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E CPA.com. Um, and you mentioned earlier our book. So anyone who, you know, wants even more information, check out our book. It's on Bigger Pockets and Amazon as well. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll have to do it again in the future because taxes are always changing, right? So yeah, um, I love to. Uh, I'll, I'll for sure come back if we see some major tax changes this year. Cool. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all the help over the last few years. We really appreciate it. Hey. Take care. Thanks. Want to get on the fast track to financial freedom through short-term rentals? Well, it all starts with the properties you acquire, but you want to make sure that you acquire the right properties. I want to give you my ebook that will show you how to do just that. There is no charge. It's my gift to you for being one of our subscribers. Just go to restmethods.com. That's R-E-S-T methods.com.